will make prayer at all times, praying that you may be strengthened, that with confidence you can meet the Son of Man. to God speak to us from the gospel in the tradition of Mark. Glory to you, Lord. A person with leprosy approached Jesus, knelt down, and said, if you are willing, you can heal me. Moved by pity, Jesus stretched out his hand, touched the person with leprosy, and said, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, the leprosy disappeared. Jesus gave a stern warning and sent the person off. Not a word to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift which Moses has prescribed. That should be a proof for them. But the person who was cured went out and began to proclaim the whole matter in public. As a result of this, it was no longer possible for Jesus to enter a town openly. He then began to stay in deserted places. Even so, people kept coming to him to heal. This is the gospel, the good news of our salvation. Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ. By the words of the gospel, may our sins be blotted out. Amen. Amen. Father? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, could not help but think of my twin brother. He has six grandchildren, and he said they rat each other out quicker than. <laughs> and I'm thinking of here this guy is told not to do something, and he goes and he rats Jesus out to anybody he can find. Um, we know that uh, leprosy is called Hansen's disease, and it's a bacterial infection that is very uh, vivacious and, and it. it very, very difficult to cure sometimes, but we do have the antibiotic, antibiotics now, um, that it's not the, the dangerous, horrible disease that it used to be. But in the time of Jesus and in the time of, as we read in the time of Moses, they didn't understand that, and it was looked upon as a curse. But they understood that it was very infectious, and those who, who were infected with Hansen's disease or leprosy would now have to live outside the, 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 uh, the city or the camp. They, they would have to live away. Um, when we read the story of St. Francis of Assisi, after his, his major conversion, the first people he went to were the lepers, who dwelled in a, hospital, a hospice uh, down outside the city. And it was with those individuals with whom he worked because he saw them as those individuals who were truly on the fringe of society. Nobody wanted them. Nobody wanted them. Um, it, it's hard to imagine uh, being ill and having a disease such as any disease, cancer, leprosy, whatever, and, and finding no compassion in the community with which you live being shunned, being told you can't live there anymore, being told you have to go and live with your own, as it were. Um, and out of the charity of maybe some people, there would, might be people there who would help you and uh, bathe you maybe, or take care of the bandaging and uh, maybe bring food or whatever it might be. I am reminded of that scene in Ben-Hur where the daughter and the sister of Ben-Hur had been inflicted with um, leprosy and they're now living in these caves. And uh, uh, this dear friend of theirs brings them food and leaves them outside the door by the, the, the entrance to the cave and because they could not have contact. Um, uh, and at the end, uh, uh, what 
Jesus is, is being crucified, the thunder, the lightning, and at the moment of Jesus' death, the lightning flashes and they are made clean. Well, that really doesn't happen that way. Um, where these people were forced to live probably was the Hilton compared to other places that lepers were forced to live. But that whole idea that here is a community that shuns its own out of fear, out of fear. And we know in our own lives today with the pandemic that we don't understand, we wear masks, and as I'm sitting here, I couldn't help but think we're going to have to reintroduce ourselves to one another after after we don't have to wear them because we forget who we are. We forget who, what you look like. Um, and, and so we, we wear our masks because this CDC says it's the easiest, the best way. We wash our hands 20 times a day uh, for whatever it is. Uh, we uh, six feet apart, social distancing, we, we do this. But a lot of this is out of fear because we don't understand. Uh, we, can, we can identify the virus and we can understand how it goes and it's airborne and all that stuff. But still, it's, it's fearful. It's fearful. Now, could you imagine what it must have been for an individual who did not understand the medical side or the science and all of a sudden finds that they have a blotch and they have to go and show it to the priest and then being told that they can't live with their families. They can't live in the community anymore. They have to live outside of the camp and they have to live alone wearing rags, uh, uncovered heads, and screaming unclean, unclean. And in some societies in the mid medieval times, they had carried a bell as well so that they would ring the bell and you could hear it, and you could make sure that you were not in that facility or that vicinity after the, uh, when you hear the bell, to, to get away from this poor individual. As I was preparing, I couldn't help but think of what Mother Teresa must have felt like when she left the Sisters of Laredo, a very well-to-do community, and she taught at a very exclusive uh, school in, in Calcutta uh, to the, uh, the higher ups, obviously. But she couldn't help but feel what these individuals must have been, those untouchables, those who are on the street, those who, who had nobody to take care of. There is a story that uh, when she had opened her community and started her community, the sisters, the missionary sisters of charity, that uh, uh, they went to pick a man up off the street who had been laying there for days and days and days on a cardboard mat. And as they lifted him up, his whole back came off. He stayed on the cardboard. He was riddled with maggots. And he was being eaten alive from the inside out. Uh, we in America have no sense of that. That is, that is so far beyond our, our, our comprehension that a society would allow an individual to reach that state. But in our own situation, we have homeless people that we see, we, we walk out the other day uh, around the side. You know, there, there was a song, how come our eyes never meet? How come we never get, to, uh, you pass me by, but you don't acknowledge me? And we shun these people off. We shun them as if they do not exist, but they are Christ. Those individuals are Christ calling out for compassion. Christ is calling for compassion in these individuals that we pass. Now, does that mean I have to give a dollar to every panhandler between here and wherever? No. No. But if we are involved in a food drive to make sure that I participate in that, and it's just not cleaning out the closet of food that I bought and decided I don't want anymore, or maybe outdated, it means voting 
uh, for reformation of these people, trying to do something for these people. But we have to remember that they are Christ. They are Christ. And that man on the street, the man who is riddled with maggots, the one who hasn't bathed in, 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 in so many months, is Christ calling out for compassion. And on the other hand, that person is the one that Jesus went to the cross for. We as church are responsible for that person. Now, we know that homelessness is more of a psychological than a uh, financial situation. And we know that when uh, Ronald Reagan opened the doors to a lot of the asylums because he said it was unconstitutional because these people were being held against their will. And they had no place to go but the streets. But today, as we listen to this, this uh, piece from Mark, we are reminded that Jesus was willing not only to heal this individual, not only to come in contact with this individual, but to reach out and touch this individual which, according to the law, would have made him ritually unclean. That technically Jesus was not allowed to go into the temple, was not allowed to pray in the community, was not allowed to go into the synagogue and hear the word, because he was ritually unclean. And yet Jesus went beyond those social standings and touched this individual and said, I will be made clean. And as we hear the story, he was clean. Now, the rest of the story is the rest of the story. Don't tell anybody. Yeah, right. And he told everybody. It's like reverse psychology. Don't do that because, it, and the kid does it, and whatever. But the point is that we as a community, as St. Paul tells us today, we cannot, we cannot shun anyone. We cannot exclude anyone from our midst because they're not like us. Mother Teresa, in her writings, wrote this, and I, I, would, I just want to uh, as some of you know, I, I send out a little blog every morning, and I must have about a thousand quotes floating around in my office. But I, I came across this uh, a while back, and I, I, it just hit me today that this might be appropriate. She says, we think sometimes that poverty is only being hungry, naked, or homeless. Poverty of being unwanted, unloved, uncared for is a greater poverty. We must start in our own homes to remedy this kind of poverty. The poverty of being unwanted, unloved, cast out. And we as Christians cannot do that. We cannot do that and call ourselves. We ask Christ for compassion in our suffering. We ask Christ for compassion for those who we love who are suffering. But do we answer the call of compassion that Christ gives us and our brothers and sisters who are suffering? So the next time we see someone on the street, someone who is suffering, let us envision that person is Christ calling to us for love, for acceptance, and for compassion. <coughs> Mother Jo said that we are having the confirmation today, and uh, Tyler has asked us uh, a while back to do that, we, and every week he's reminded us, I'd like to be confirmed, so I'd like to be confirmed. 
okay, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, and finally we've made it a date, and uh, that's our fault, not with her. But thank you for your uh, uh, proactiveness in, in the decision. Uh, a little bit of history, confirmation and baptism in the early church was one sacrament. Uh, at the end of the <coughs> baptism, the bishop would confirm and seal the baptism with holy oil, like you would uh, say, for example, what they used to do with, with uh, uh, wine or anything, they would, they would seal it with oil, because oil would then protect it when it came back. Uh, and so the, the bishop would, would anoint the individual uh, with the Holy Spirit at the end of their baptism. But as the church grew, the bishop couldn't go to all the baptisms, and so deacons and priests became the baptism, and they would put off this confirmation until the bishop would visit the, the town or village. And then all those who were baptized up until that point, the bishop would then, and that's how we get the confirmation, uh, as we, we understand it, when the bishop would come and everybody would sing, and the deacons would fly, and the, the rectory, uh, Thirty priests would be wine dyed. <laughs> uh, that was it for the confirmande. That was for the priest, and it was a big thing because you invited every every priest in the area, you know, to have a dinner. And many many rectories were constructed where they had sliding glass doors from the living room into the dining room so that they could extend the tables and have these huge uh, feasts. But that's beside the point. That's not what we're here for. So. Let us, uh, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles received the Holy Spirit as the Lord had promised. They also received the power of giving the Holy Spirit to others, and so completed the work of baptism. This we read in the Acts of the Apostles. When St. Paul placed his hands upon those who had been baptized, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they began to speak in languages and prophetic words. So I call Tyler to come forward, please. Uh, Taylor. Tyler. A apple. Tomato, <laughs> tomato. So before receiving the Holy Spirit, I ask you to renew the profession you made at your baptism. And I would ask everybody to participate by uh, uh, responding, I do, to these questions as well. Do you reject Satan in all his works and all his empty promises? I do. Do you believe in God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth? I do. I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, which is about to be given to you in the sacrament of confirmation? The Lord, the giver of life, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, Resurrection of the body and life everlasting. I do. I do. I do. This is our faith. This is the faith of our church. Let us be proud to profess it in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I would ask you to extend your right hand as we place our hands upon you. Tyler received the Holy Spirit, the gift of God. Peace be with you. Yes. 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 Yes.